as if a model train had come to life. In the far-flung valleys of Sichuan, life follows its own rhythm, somewhat more relaxed than elsewhere in China. A little steam train is the only means of transportation for the people around here. Its whistling echoes through the ravines. There is no road here. Anyone wanting to go to the market or just visit the next valley has to either walk or take the train. Steep rock walls, rice terraces, hills, and rivers. The little train fights its way over ascending slopes and back downhill, around bends and through tunnels, skimming past the houses and right through the town. Its narrow gauge railway tracks are ideal for this impassable terrain here in Sichuan, in the heart of China, south of the megacity Chengdu. The train route isn't very long, but this approximately 20 kilometer stretch of railway track is the only connection to the outside world for the residents of the scattered villages. The little train always has right of way. Whoever misses it has to drive over the railway tracks by motorbike. Without a helmet, of course. This way, it's easier to listen to the radio. The railway track is the main route for pedestrians, too, because it is the only way to get through the forests and mountains. There is good reason for the train's constant whistling. The train driver, Wang Shabin, starts his shift. Go to work with joy and return in good health is written on the entrance of the train depot. Wang signs in for his shift. His colleague has already finished. He has heated up the engines that are about to be used. Seven steam trains are constantly in operation. Even the switching moves at the Shehi station are powered by steam. Wang Shabin has to examine the locomotives thoroughly before departure. He completes an inspection round before every trip, as the trains are old and consist mainly of spare parts. There's always something broken. I have to retighten the screws. A vast amount of water is required to produce steam. Locomotive number 16 is flooded for minutes. This job wasn't my childhood dream. They were looking for train drivers, and I applied. The work is quite hard. Wang is going to drive the route twice today. We have a great responsibility as drivers. If an accident occurs, they deduct the cost from our salaries. We have to be very attentive as we don't want anyone to be injured. Wang Shabin used to be a postman. He was trained for three months before he was allowed to take on sole responsibility as a train driver on China's last year-round regularly scheduled passenger steam train. A particularly large crowd gathers on market day in Shehi, at the northern end of the terminal. The simple carriages are already full half an hour before departure. The farmers bring back their shopping goods to the villages of the valley. Supplies, vegetables, live chickens, and passengers 
Everything is squeezed in and skillfully stacked. Wang will be driving back and forth along the route for two and a half hours. During the rapeseed flowering season in spring, the landscape looks as if a model maker had tipped over a tin of yellow paint. Rice terraces, bamboo groves, and banana trees flourish between the rapeseed fields. In Shaojian Zhao, people have a lot of time. Tsung Ping, the butcher, has already been waiting for two hours. Together with his colleague, he wants to transport pigs to Bai Zhao Gu. Finally, the animals arrive. And so does the train, one hour later. There are no separate carriages for the animals. A separate compartment is created in the passenger carriage with the help of a gate. We bought these pigs from the local farmers. We're taking them to Baijai Go now. No glass in the windows, simple wooden benches, bare metal walls, and occasionally pigs in the carriage. The little train is not really comfortable. The pigs are going to be slaughtered in Baijiao Gu. Their meat will be sold on the market. Whoever comes from the valley to shop there will be traveling with Wang or one of his colleagues. A regional commodity cycle powered by steam. Mountain bikes, furniture, livestock. The little train is indispensable in this valley. For the pigs, the journey continues at breakneck speed. Bai Jiao Go is the second to last stop for the train. But for the animals, it is literally the end of the line. Tseng Ping drives them forward with a bamboo stick. At the town square, Chairman Mao is emblazoned above the propaganda stage that dates back to the Cultural Revolution. Baijiagu means banana forest, an enchanting place almost frozen in time. Not long ago, in the 1940s, this little shopping street built by an Anglo-Chinese mining company used to house opium dens and brothels. Today, the little town seems like an open-air museum representing traditional China. In the hills above Baijai Go, peasants live as they have done for centuries, growing rice and vegetables from every available piece of land. It's early morning, and Wang Xixian has already harvested. Peasant woman Wang runs the farm with her husband, their daughter is already grown up. She wants to sell her vegetables at Shuhi Market. The basket can weigh up to 20 kilos when it's fully loaded. It takes her more than half an hour to walk down the hill to the train station. The dainty Wang balances the basket effortlessly as she weaves her way along the clay walls of the paddy fields. This is her regular commute. There is a little daily market in Bai Jiao Gu, but once a week, peasant woman Wang also sells her goods at the big market in Shuhi, which can only be reached by train. The Bai Jiao Gu train station has recently been renovated. Yeah. 
With a little luck, I'll get 51 for my chards. Wang needs to sell all the vegetables in her basket today. Otherwise, the journey to Shuhi is not profitable. A one-way ticket costs her 5 yuan, approximately 60 cents. The tickets can be bought directly from the conductor. I take the train to Shuhi four times a month. I also shop there myself. Mostly seedlings. It takes Wang a little over one hour to get to Shuhi, while more and more farmers squeeze into the carriages at every station. The engine house is also located in the market town of Shuhi. The locomotives need constant repair and maintenance, bolting, welding, hammering. Morning meeting for the engine house team. The foreman explains what tasks need to be done today. <laughs> Lu Chun Li is a mechanic, toolmaker, and engine fitter. One has to be a jack of all trades around here. I make spare parts. Lu Chun Li's inspections are as sharp as her cutting tools. This is going to be a bolt for the locomotive's control rod. I have to finish four of these today. The little train is the last steam train, so you can't buy the spare parts anymore. That's why we make them ourselves. It's cheaper as well. Mechanic He Chun is going to put the part to the test. Do Chun Li's bolts fit precisely? These connecting parts transfer the whole power of the steam engine to the wheels. Chun Li's parts fit perfectly. The locomotives were built specially for the unique requirements of this route. Four pairs of little wheels lie close together. Shuai Zhugang is responsible for safety. He knows all the weak spots of the old train inside out and is aware of the parts that need double checking. The short trains are good for this route. A regular train would be more than 70 meters long. The locomotive alone is more than 20 meters long. It wouldn't be able to drive around the bends very well. Our locomotives are only 14 meters long. They don't have any trouble with the narrow bends. For decades, the building plans were considered lost. And when the files reappeared, no one recognized their value. The president of the mining company is still angry about it today. Five years ago, a professor at China's Mining and Technology University found the files in a Taiwanese library. He called us to ask if we wanted a copy. Unfortunately, at the time, we thought we didn't need them. Over the years, almost every single component of the locomotives has been replaced at some point. Today's locomotives are masterpieces of metal fitting, pieced together from spare parts, made individually by hand, mostly without an exact design. Right next to the engine house lies the market of Shuhi, the biggest one in this region. The moon calendar determines the market days. It takes place about nine times a month. Peasant woman Wang is late. The train was late. All the good selling spots are taken already. She squeezes in between motorbikes in front of a newly opened store. Nevertheless, she doesn't have to wait long for the first customer, a good omen for the day. Okay. 
At Shuhi Market, you can buy anything that might be considered a feast for Chinese palates. However, more likely to be an acquired taste for most Westerners. A special breed is much sought after at the poultry stall. Black chickens. Jet black after plucking, to be more precise. Charlatans, hairdressers, miracle workers, and fortune tellers. They have arranged their camping tables on the outskirts of the market. For a few yuan, you can hear what your future holds. Tseng Fu Gao is blind in one eye, a sure sign of competence for fortune tellers. I can see it clearly now. Young mothers particularly enjoy the consultation. Your boy is going to accomplish a lot. He was born this year at one o'clock in the morning on the 13th of the first moon calendar. Belief in omens, lucky charms and fortune tellers is very normal in China. Many live their lives accordingly. He told me that my son doesn't have a patron god yet. Usually newborns have a patron god. We must find one now. I think this would be good for him. Everything is based on the principle of yin and yang. There are 10 heavenly stems and 12 earthly branches. According to this system, and together with the birth dates, I can foretell the future. Lu Chunyi, the mechanic from the engine house nearby, is also at the market. She wants to buy pork legs for the team of mechanics. Lu examines the butcher's displays with the same close inspection she uses to check her bolts. She only makes a bid at the third stall. Chun Li is going to prepare a very special dish, knuckle of pork, locomotive style, so to speak. A hot pot meal in the truest sense of the word. It goes like this. You take a steam locomotive, preheat it to seven or 800 degrees, open the oven, Place the pork on top of the blazing embers with a tong and wait a few minutes. Locomotive driver Yan Yuan swears by the unique smoked aroma of this dish. Five to seven minutes in the oven. Then the pork knuckle tastes much better. We often make it in winter. Afterwards, it also gets cooked for a while. The mechanics have welded themselves a little oven so they can cook the meat. Conveniently enough, there is hot coal in every train that arrives. The thick layer of black soot is scraped off, of course, but the special locomotive aroma remains in the meat. Chun Li cuts the pork into pieces before she cooks it. This pork dish out of the locomotive oven is so popular in winter because it gives you strength. The skin gets a very special taste from burning it in the oven. Now the meat will get cooked for another hour. Altogether, it takes about two hours until the dish is ready to be served. The cooking happens right in the middle of the engine house. It was built for steam trains, so a little smoke is really not a problem. The special flavor enhancer is so strong that no other spices are necessary. The employees of the engine house don't need to be asked twice. 
and eat the hot pot meal with visible appetite. Steady companions of the little train, the coal collectors. When the locomotive throws out ashes from time to time, there is always a lot of coal in it that hasn't finished burning yet. A valuable resource for heating and cooking. Not a single small piece gets lost. The little train has to conquer 108 bends and climb 238 meters in altitude. The difficult terrain is also the main reason why there is still no road connecting the villages to this day. And even the school can only be reached on foot, by motorbike, or by train. When the children of the school of Tsaiba read out loud, it echoes through the whole valley. There are six classes here. The primary school is responsible for all the children from the villages within a wide radius around here. Chen Jiahui is 11. Like all the children here, she is hardworking, disciplined, and hungry for knowledge. Their teacher's name is Miss Peng. I live in Bai Jai Go. Every morning, I take the train to school. On the way back, I have to walk. Most of the children have to walk too, walk very far. The train doesn't come as often as it used to, and the schedule is inconvenient. Therefore, many of the students have to walk up to two hours one way. This is really hard for the children, especially in the summer. Then they often get soaking wet, or the sun is scorching, and it gets very hot around here. It's hard and dangerous. It's really not easy for the kids. School is out in the early afternoon. A few children are picked up with a moped, but for most of them, a long walk begins. Soon Jahui is on her own. Two hours to the furthest station, with worn out shoes over the railway tracks. Every day, no matter what the weather is like, she has to pass through four tunnels. She knows the train schedule by heart, but some trains come unannounced. I walk through them all on my own. A security guard is positioned in front of the longest tunnel. Here you can't see the other end of the tunnel at first. It's my task not to let anyone into the tunnel when a train is about to arrive. I'm in charge of security. At first I was very scared to enter the tunnel. I get up so early that it's still dark outside. I was scared to fall over. The torchlight is an essential item in her school bag. Jahui lives literally only an arm's length away from the railway tracks, and the train to school drives right past her house. Unfortunately, not at the right time. The soot of the steam train blackens the kitchen walls. After her long march, Jahui gets a bowl of rice first and then there's homework to be done. Every day after school, I have to do one to two pages of homework. Um, I think I need about half an hour for that. A 
A few hundred meters behind Jahui's house, an old mine head tower reminds one of the beginnings of the little train. The coal mine of Watsunjing was closed long ago. Nevertheless, for Mao's great leap forward, the forced industrialization of the country at the end of the 1950s, steel and coal were needed in vast amounts. Railway tracks were built to transport the coal, irrespective of the terrain. The little train started out as a coal transporter. At the other end of the line, in Shuhi, coal trains still exist today. Now they run on electricity and serve another mine. For Li Chechang, it was heavy labor to build the railway tracks for the steam train. We build all this with pure manpower. Machines didn't exist. With modern machinery, the railway tracks could have been built much faster, of course. For every little section, hundreds of workers were needed. We had to carry the railway sleepers on our shoulders and screwed them together by hand. We slept on simple beds made of rice straw, sometimes under roofs made of banana leaves, sometimes at farmers' houses. They kept their pigs next to us. Many just slept outside in the open air with only a blanket to cover them. That's how it used to be back then. Actually, we were quite content with that. Li Chechang is completely content with his life, although most of it consisted of heavy labor. When the railway track was finished, he went underground to mine. When we built the tracks, everyone was given 200 grams of rice each day and a little something on the side, mostly a cabbage soup with cooked radish or radish soup with cooked cabbage. We were really starving. Sometimes we went and looked for wild herbs or grasses during our breaks. That was very different compared to today, where no one has to starve anymore. The railway track is just a stone's throw away. The track section, for which he worked almost to complete exhaustion, lies shortly before Bai Jago, only one hour away by steam train. Maybe it is due to the experience of life-threatening hunger for years. Although he lives in a modern flat in the city, Li Chechang still stocks food and keeps live chickens in his bedroom. No, I never went back there, not once. If I think of Baza Go, then I have to think of the very hard work we had to do. I remember every hill slope and every house. Well, it's not far from here. I could just take the little train, but I've gone through too much down there. No, I don't even want to go there again. The construction of the railway tracks happened at the time of Mao's great leap forward, industrialization without consideration of possible damage, followed by the longest period of starvation in history. Building the line with the narrow gauge rail tracks into the impassable terrain cost many lives. Already in 1959, the first locomotive was sent on its journey. When I dared to do the very first journey on this newly built route, it took me three days to complete 20 kilometers. Three days! I slept on the locomotive. I was simply too scared to drive faster. The track was awful and too soft. It juddered and jolted terribly. Today, Chen lives down by the river. He used to drive the coal loads here for shipping. Back then, his mother starved to death right in front of his eyes. He was only saved by the scraps of food they got from the mining company. The local people feel such a strong attachment to the little train as a result of the extremely hard times they endured. My love for the little train will never die. It was very hard work and very, very hot. Some locomotive drivers were discouraged by that. I wasn't. The little train will always have a special place in my heart. Sometimes I still dream of standing in the locomotive and driving the train. 
I dreamt that only two days ago. I prepared everything and started the engine. Today, the students of my students drive the train, and they still know who I am. When I visit the engine house, they say, Master, may I have a photo taken with you? Today, the dramas of the past are partly taboo and partly entertainment for the slowly growing domestic tourism. On the weekends, Bajagul is hardly recognizable anymore. Crowds of visitors. The Red Army uniforms are sold to the beat of techno music. Bajagul is the first town in the valley to have road access, even if only for special tourist buses. Mao's slogans are nothing more than a nice backdrop for a photo for modern Chinese people. Guided groups travel on the same route as the locals usually do, but in much more comfortable carriages, complete with glass windows and air conditioning. The tickets for these trains are exorbitant for the residents of the valley. An urban and wealthy public examines traditional rural life with curiosity. Two different worlds meet. Whether for tourist groups or rice farmers, the route is the same. Only the stops differ. The farmers don't need to stop for photos. Train driver Wang Shabin knows, without the revenue from the relatively new tourist trains, the little train would be bankrupt already. It was seen as uneconomical and was due to be closed down. The train fare was very low, and in the 90s the company suffered a multi-million yuan loss. Fun Gang is the president of the mining company, and hence also of the steam train. Its end was already decided, but the residents of the valley fought for their train. The company had already planned to replace the railway with a road, so that more public buses could operate. That would solve the problem of public transportation. We already had funds for the plan. But it raised conflict. Economically, keeping the train running made no sense. It would make us suffer huge losses. If a company only performs its social function, it won't survive. But we found out that we could make a profit if we first invest in the train. For the locals, the train was always more than just a means of transportation. It is part of their lives. I grew up with the little train in Baijai Go. When we heard its whistling as children, we all ran to the big square and yelled, the train is here, <laughs> and we were happy. Shangli runs a little hotel, the first one in the valley, with a toilet and internet access, luxuries that didn't exist in this region a few years ago. Shangli hopes to be able to live off the income from her guests one day. The residents of Baijiagu like to meet at their mahjong tables. Mahjong is played constantly and with great enthusiasm. And such a practical, tidy mechanism perfect order at the push of a button. The little train was always like a friend to me. In my mind, it was my companion. My parents could never afford to buy a lot of toys. We were always very poor. So the little train was my toy. Shang Li is extraordinarily happy about the rain today, because tomorrow is Qingming, the festival for the dead. This is when the people commemorate their ancestors, and it is a good sign when the sky cries before the start. All the trinkets that the people need to commemorate their ancestors are sold on every street, primarily money for the other world. Laboriously cut out, handmade notes from bamboo fibers or a common currency in the afterworld, 
and very important, loud fireworks. The Chinese dead love noise. On top of that, more paper money with fantastical sums and incense sticks. Zhang Li has got everything she needs. Tomorrow, she wants to visit her father's grave in the mountains above Baijiago. Wang Xixian, the peasant woman, is already there, up in the mountains of Baijiago. She is back from the market and was able to sell all of her vegetables. Wang did some shopping herself too. The most important ingredient of the notorious Sichuan cuisine, chili seedlings. Here in Sichuan, hands full of chili are thrown into the dishes and they grow very well in Wang's garden. I can harvest them in about two months and then I'll sell them again. Wang's husband is heating up the oven with bamboo wood. A strange thing hangs above the stove with its huge walks. It looks like a mummified bird. I need such a big wok because I also cook the food for the pigs in here. We used to have more than 10 pigs. Today there are only two. So what do you do with a strange bird dangling above the stove? We eat it. It used to be that big. We salted it and smoked it. That way it keeps longer. You can either cook it with soya sauce or steam it. I serve it with some great yellow cress and asparagus salad. Not something to ward off evil, just dried meat. Wang and her husband are self-sufficient with their chickens and two pigs, some geese, goats and their vegetables. The ravines of Baijagul look like a prehistoric primordial landscape with fern trees where once dinosaurs may have grazed on their leaves. For generations, the dead have been buried in this dramatic landscape in rock graves carved right into the stone. Shang Li, the hotel owner, wants to visit her father's grave. He died young when she was only a child. His urn is carved into the rocks high above Baijagul. The ascent takes almost an hour. There are no paths. We all use the paper money around here. I will hang up these paper flags first, though, as a sign that I've visited my ancestors. Sweeping the grave is how the Chinese also call this annual ritual. More important than the cleaning, however, is pleasing the dead with paper money, incense, noises, and prayers. This is how we show our respect and gratitude to our parents. They raised us, after all. In the past, my brother and sister-in-law used to take me here every year. Now I'm grown up and come here on my own. Well, now I'll send up some money to my father. The afterworld money made from bamboo fibers passes into the other world in the form of smoke.
At the end of the ritual, the fireworks. The special salutes echo through the valley often these days. The market of Shuhi is closing now, and a certain calm is restored in the little town. On every corner, in every tea house, people play mahjong or Sichuan poker. The card game is supposed to be more than 2,000 years old, and the people of Sichuan proudly claim to be the most enthusiastic mahjong and card players in the whole of China. Also in the healing center at the outskirts of the market, the people play Sichuan poker. In the back room, all kinds of pains are healed according to the principles of traditional Chinese medicine, with acupuncture and fire cupping. If you don't feel well, this will help. With anything, also against the cold. Those who work hard for years feel especially worn out. No wonder that the locomotive drivers of the little train trust in the traditional Chinese art of healing. The train drivers come to me very often. They come two or three times a month for a treatment. Shen Chenming, the very first locomotive driver, very rarely comes into town. Together with Li Shacheng, the track worker, he pays the new tourist train station a visit. It is amazing for the elderly man to see what has been made of the little coal train that influenced their lives so immensely. Li Shecheng is curious to know what the tourists pay for a trip on his railway tracks, which he built with his bare hands. There are combined tickets for a train ride and an underground mining experience. These are the tickets we have. How much is a return ticket? 150 yuan, which is about $25. Li wouldn't be able to afford that, but he doesn't want to go back underground to the mine, where he had to work so hard. He would much rather have Chen show him a locomotive. I heard his name, Master San, all the time, but I never met him until now. He drove the train overground. I mined coal underground. So how could we have met? Today, with all his passion and enthusiasm, he showed me how to drive the train, where to put the water in, told me about accidents that occurred, how to operate the train. I never experienced anything like today. I had never been inside the cab before. I had only been on the carriages. I want to have you as my master. Will you teach me as your train driving student? I promise to be a diligent pupil. <laughs> The last train for today makes its way. At the depot of Shehi, repairs continue as always. They are working non-stop on the ramshackle locomotives, which need maintenance after almost every trip, whether it is bolting, welding, or hammering. Wang Shabin has finished two trips with the little train and needs to do some switching still. If he throws out ashes, the coal collectors are right at hand and won't let a single little piece of usable heating material get lost. End of shift. I'm always happy when I'm back safely and nothing has happened. 
Depending on the shift, I then either drive home to my family or I sleep here. Over there is a residential home for the drivers, where I have a room. The residential home. Simple sleeping accommodation for the train drivers on three floors. This dates back to the coal rush period of the little train, when it was used to transport the coal nuggets here from Baijiagu. Today, the tourist train is supposed to earn the nuggets. Wang doesn't have to worry about his workplace. Plans to bring the little train to an end no longer exist. In 2008, it was even declared an industrial monument. Wang will carry on driving the peasants and butchers with their pigs through the valleys of Sichuan. Then, he will return exhausted to his little room at the residential home, which itself looks like an industrial monument. There is no comfort after the drudgery and the heat, not even a shower. Nonetheless, Wang doesn't complain. He is happy in the knowledge that he will soon drive home to his wife and son by motorbike. While Wang is freshening up, loudspeakers are hung up on the squares of the town. This happens every night, not only around here, it is a national hobby. Collective dancing, something Wang probably doesn't consider doing after his long day of hard work. It is mostly women anyway, who meet every night around sundown for the open air ballet. Depending on the preference of the group, the focus can be either on keep fit or on dancing. The main thing is that everyone is in motion. And the little train will continue to provide the locomotion here in the valleys, in the heart of China. In the land of the mega cities, where growth knows no limits, a dinosaur of the industrial age drives over the narrow gauge railway tracks, powered by steam and ardently loved.